And here we go. Uh, just one clarification, if you have any questions or something comes to your mind, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me or just put it in the chat and we will answer afterwards. Uh, as I said, uh, this event is organized within the project Media Motor Europe, uh, submitted and implemented uh, under Horizon 2020, now Horizon Europe. What is it about, in few words, out-of-the-box thinking? Why? Because we would like to nurture and encourage and support high potential deep tech startups from Europe in the media and creative industries, trying and helping them to solve the challenges to build solutions for tomorrow and uh, for rapid development of the media industry. And what we want to achieve at the end is, of course, here more engaged, better connected media and creative innovation ecosystem, validated startups and scale ups, accelerating their growth altogether of 60 companies and developing at the end sustainable ecosystem by matching them also with media corporations and companies. Project summary. We are seven partners all together from uh, six countries, working with high potential startups and scale ups as our target group, providing them with mentoring program and developing and implementing three cycles each of six months. We've been already through two of them and the third one is actually your last chance to apply and join us as I said, in this journey. The, per the partners, we are organized as follow. We have four hubs hosted by Media Hub VRT Sandbox from Brussels, the Media City Bergen Media Hub, our Innovation Hub in Sofia Knowledge City, and Innovation Hub of Termi Ventures of our partners from Greece, one of our partners from Greece in Thessaloniki, and the so-called supporting partners uh, who provide support during the program in terms of the technology, Athens Technology Center, Startup Europe Network, you know it, they have success, the European sorry, Startup Network, and Fast Track Action from Portugal. Our cluster, Sofia Knowledge City, who is the host of the event, together with the hub in Bulgaria in Sofia, uh, it represents the innovation hub, which is built around the collaboration of the cluster itself, the supporting partners like Sofia Tech Park, Bulgarian Industrial Capital Association, and the Bulgarian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who are our partners and co-hosts of today's event. Innovation Hub uh, Sofia was created with uh, the main idea and goal of uh, being the technology mediator supporting deep tech startups and scale ups, providing workshops for innovations, innovation management lab, media station platform for matchmaking. The Media Motor Europe, what's in it for you? We have, as I said, three open calls for startups and scale ups, and we've been through two of them. The results so far are 170 applications that were submitted, 32 countries represented, and 40 of these 170 selected according to evaluation criteria and a committee that is doing the evaluation. These <clears throat> startups represent 19 countries. And we are happy to share with you that uh, from Bulgaria during the first open call, we had eight applications, which put us at the third place. One of them was successful and uh, approved for participation in the program, which was basically the first so-called support cycle. And today in the second part, uh, you will see the video of Adhash, who was the participant from Bulgaria in the first open call. And then in the second open call, we also had one very successful application from Bulgaria, Mimirium, 
you will also see their video and their pitch. This is the, the results from the second support cycle. As you can see, we accepted 21, uh, uh, 21 were selected out of 84. And the next steps of our journey are the third support cycle, which is, sorry, you can see the startup needs here uh, based on the results from the first two support cycles. Of course, the major need is finding funding and investment from NVC agreement, product co-development testing, technology licensing, know-how service agreement, and least, last but not least, addressing the needs of private and public procurement. The third open call is with the deadline of 27 of May. Uh, it's supposed to start in July and last for six months, during which you will have a coaching support by a dedicated attached coach to each one of the startups, matchmaking with investors, large corporations and companies, and networking and opportunities for pitching during events. I will remind you of this call and show you the website and how to apply at the end of the webinar. But first of all, I would like to ask if you have any questions so far. Okay. Milena, if you if you allow me, yeah. on behalf of the Investment Council and the, uh, of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to congratulate uh, all participants to to, to the, uh, today's uh, meeting, and uh, to wish you all um, uh, good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, and sorry, I missed this part, but the session will be recorded just for your information. Uh, it will be used for only for internal purposes. And now I will share with you the video pitches of uh, the startups that are participating today in the discussion panel and throughout the whole session. And as I mentioned before, also the two Bulgarian startups who were successful in the first two open calls. Hi, my name is Adriana, co-founder of AtHash. AtHash is about creating a more transparent, more efficient and user-centric model for monetizing the open internet. Um, AtHash is a protocol which enables advertisers for the first time to serve ads and to um, leverage real-time first-party data directly from their own servers. Um, this enables publishers, on the other hand, to capture more of the value they create so they can keep creating the quality journalism and authentic content that we enjoy for free. Privacy. Do you believe in it? Do you truly believe in users' right to actually own control and even monetize their data? Nowadays, a lot of people talk that data is the new oil. And still, all the companies expect, no, they even insist that users have to provide their data for free. The video network is an ecosystem of different tools that allow the users to collect the data they generate in internet or on their mobile devices into their own devices in an encrypted way. And after that, with their consent, they can participate in different kinds of data mining, online surveys, marketing researches, and get paid for that. We are using homomorphic encryption, zero-knowledge proof, secure multi-part computation, blockchain, and smart contracts to ensure that no raw data and no personal data is transmitted in this process. And all that the companies get is only anonymized, aggregated result over the computation of the user's data, which provides our users 100% anonymity and privacy. Hello, we are Project Vixtape. Project Vixtape is a media and technology platform that distributes a combination of ambient and interactive content that integrates with advertising in a less intrusive way. This content can play on TVs and digital signage in bars, offices, retail centers, travel hubs, and the outdoors. We believe that media can teach us things, can change our moods for the better, and it can introduce us to new products and services. 
Instead of showing people irrelevant content, violating user privacy, or showing just 100% ads on screens, we are building a decentralized programmatic marketplace that connects to outside advertising technology and content publishers. Audiences can connect with the media or brand messages through their personal devices, allowing them to take actions if they're interested, such as signing up for newsletters, making purchases, and following social media feeds. We are running test campaigns over the next few months, and we could use some help forging new relationships with cultural institutions across Europe. This new media and ad format aligns with the future of advertising, and we are excited to share it. Thank you. Hi everyone, we are DeepVA and we simplify computer vision AI. Our office is located in southern Germany in the beautiful city of Freiburg. But what does simplifying computer vision AI actually mean? We analyze the content of images and videos. Our AI identifies people, landmarks, objects, and much, much more. But DeepVA does not only provide you precise visual analytics, but also allows you to customize the AI to your specific needs. Our whole team is excited to be a part of this project and we are looking forward to meeting you guys. Hello from London, I'm Eddie. And I'm Stathis, and we are the co-founders of Envision. At Envision, we're reimagining video content creation with our cognitive AI technology. Our cloud-based platform helps creators save time and effort searching and editing their videos. We are currently testing our solution with early adopters and looking to engage with more media companies soon. Through Media Motor Europe, we hope to get support, expand our network, and explore more commercial opportunities. We look forward to meeting you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Hi, my name is Miguel Silva. I'm the founder and CEO of Visualist. We are a company that helps the film and TV industry quality assure their videos and visually inspect them uh, towards compliance requirement purposes uh, before they can publish them. Uh, for example, in every country, there is different tolerance to nudity, to violence, to, um, to different ratings for different age groups who are going to be seeing these videos. Um, there's all these different uh, rules. For example, in the UK, children are not allowed to be depicted on video if they're not wearing helmets, etc., etc. And this is usually a problem that the producers of the video don't really worry that much about, but that distributors do, because they need to fulfill all the regulatory requirements for every marketing which they distribute. So what we do is we made a software as a service uh, solution that allows them to ingest video. We use artificial intelligence to crawl the video and automatically detect things that may be problematic. And then we provide a compliance review and, uh, and collaboration tool on top of that for teams to be able to do this work in record speed. Thank you very much. I hope to uh, talk to all of you during the, uh, the program. I hope you enjoyed and you met our uh, participants in the some of the participants in the program uh, and uh, the guys who will be joining us today for the second the third part uh, of the discussion that we are approaching but first of all again i would like to ask are there any questions at this point you would like to ask Okay, anything in the chat? No. Okay, then. So I suggest to go directly to the more interactive part and give the floor to our main panelists who are uh, invited to join, the representatives, as you saw from the videos uh, from the startups who were successful in the first two support cycles. And uh, I would like to ask each one of them just to say a few words about themselves. Uh, I'm asking now to uh, Michael. Michael is here or no? Hi. Hi, Michael. Couldn't see you in the participant list. It's quite long and it's getting longer. <laughs> okay, the big step. The floor is yours. 
Great. Hi, I'm Michael Fiorentino. I'm from Vixtape. Uh, we operate out of Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, so I applied to the Media Motor Europe program. And um, at the time, uh, my co-founders and I had one vision of the company, but obviously COVID changes a lot of things. And one of the first things that happened was about a little over a month into joining the Media Motor Europe program, uh, my co-founders and I decided to split directions. Uh, and that was a very sort of challenging, shocking time. A lot of it was because they wanted to focus on outdoor spaces. I wanted to focus on indoor spaces. And Media Motor Europe really helped me by connecting to my coach, uh, conversations with Belina, uh, to just say, okay, let's get you back up. Let's get you out there. So what are you missing? And so for me, it was the engineering resources. Uh, and so what really helped me was the warm introductions to local companies. Um, and just finding developers that could actually fit the role. So it really just solved that problem quickly. Um, and one of the other things where I found Media Motor Europe was helpful was, um, you saw it probably in the video, if you saw pink in the video, um, we're a promotional platform and we have some really progressive thoughts about where data and media and the exchanging of that is moving. Uh, and some of it definitely makes sort of, uh, I would say capitalistic sense in terms of budgets and advertising. But there is a piece that's more about the societal benefit. And one of the challenges I saw was that as a company, we probably would only be forced to do what made money in the short term if we were just independent. But again, by being part of Media Motor Europe, I was able to sort of explore more of the potential uses. And even now we are working with an MBA program. Uh, I was connected to two universities and they're doing their final projects exploring um, how the patented technology that we've created uh, can sort of what the implications are in the long run. And the final thing I wanted to say was, especially towards the end of the program, it really was helpful to connect and learn more about the other programs participating. I found that a lot of the uh, media ecosystem, it's nice to see what the next generation is doing. And there is definitely a shared sense of values. And these are conversations that we've started and we've continued to uh, within this cluster, but also in the other programs. So as Media Motor Europe accepts more applicants, it's just more people to have an easy introduction to. And it, again, it is really a, a nice shared experience. So to conclude, I just wanna say Media Motor Europe is very helpful, very supportive. I think that it broadened my horizons and capabilities and I'm getting ready to do a fundraising round very soon. So thank you, Media Motor Europe. Happy to answer any <laughs> thank questions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you once again for joining us today. Your story is really interesting. So once we hear everyone, I will ask you to go a little bit more in detail about the challenges and then the great opportunities. Uh, I see Miguel is here. Uh, Miguel? Yes, hi, Milena. Hi, Thanks for that. Hi, hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my name is Miguel Silva. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Visualist. You saw my beautiful video pitch. Certainly wasn't as high quality as some of the other video pitches that got sent in. Um, and we did send it in, um, where was it, in November, December last year. So you saw my beautiful Christmas tree behind me. <laughs> that pitch is one of the first things I noticed when I, when I saw it again. Um, so we, uh, we are currently going through the, uh, the program right now. We're, we're part of the, uh, the cohort that is currently um, going through and echoing a little bit what was said by my, my colleague previously. What I think is most useful for us right now is being able to, um, to network uh, with other media technology uh, companies in Europe. Um, certainly media technology is not one of those areas that, that I find has been particularly focused on um, in a lot of the startup hubs in Europe. Um, you know, we are based out of Norway and here in Norway, it's actually not been, um, even though we've already gone through certain uh, fundraising rounds and we will be going through another fundraising round uh, soon enough. Uh, but it's been um, a little bit difficult to find uh, investors, coaches, mentors that have, uh, that have previously been in our shoes, to put it that way, and that have actually done media technology uh, uh, startups. Um, so being part of an environment where you actually have people that have done that and, and being part of an environment where, where people are currently doing that actually um, has been very helpful. Uh, you, do, you do find a lot of uh, people you can bounce ideas um, from that you can network with um, and you can just um, um, feel less lonely with, to put it that way. 
Thank you for your kind words. And uh, yes, regarding the Christmas tree, all of you can see that the videos were real and the program was real and it happened. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a job. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. We will be elaborating also on your success and your experience. And we will go back certainly to the key question and major need of all startups of the funding and finding investment. Uh, but before that, I would like to give the word to Statis from InVision. I see he has already joined us. Yes. Hi, everyone. Statis here. Thank you, Milena, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Very excited to be here, part of the community. Um, similar to Miguel, we're also part of the same uh, cohort. Uh, we are still part of Cycle 2. Uh, we're based in London. Um, we are an AI company. Uh, working with media companies, among others. Um, again, the main reason for us to join the program was obviously the mentoring. We got really exciting mentor on board and support throughout the program. I was still uh, actively part of the program, so still ongoing, uh, but obviously also the potential introductions and uh, connections with partners uh, that can help us accelerate our development and move to the next phase of our growth. Obviously, we are still in early, early product phase, so it's an amazing opportunity to get this platform to um, have early testing with companies um, to help us um, grow and give us feedback early on. I'm really glad to be here and happy to answer more questions in a bit. Yes, thank you. Uh, unfortunately, I can't see Alex from Deep VA. or Florian. Okay, so uh, thank you, Statis. You actually made the transition to the second part of uh, participants in the panel, our coaches. And thank you for the kind words of uh, all of you guys so far, because uh, this is one of our uh, major goals and uh, strengths of having such uh, experienced, knowledgeable and insightful coaches to support you in the process. Uh, so I would like to invite Dimo, who is actually a coach, to share, to say a few words about himself and see that he was able to join. Yes, thank you, uh, Milena. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dimo Dimov. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working with Studies in Eddie on uh, Envision as, as a coach, but in my, in my other day job, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at the University of, of Bath here in the UK. Um, I've, I've been a, a, an academic now uh, engaged with not only teaching, but uh, with research and in working with startups for over 15 years now. And my background before that was in the hospitality business, um, running two hotels in Hungary. So I was a CFO with, with Marriott before that. So it's been very, very exciting to be part of Media Motor Europe, uh, work with um, really energetic individuals who are out there to going out there to change the world for the better have really really interesting ideas and it's it's great to be part of that journey and of course uh, my my role i see my role is is trying to work with them through the uh, through the challenges uh, just just very quickly one of the things just to pick up on what miguel said earlier about this need to work with people who have uh, who've been in the media space before so th there is a sense in which everybody is going on a unique journey uh, but, but of course, from, from my role, having observed the space for over 20 years, at the end of the day, there's only a handful of, of main challenges that every startup needs to address. And it's, it's all about how do you work out the specifics. So ultimately, someone needs to buy, ultimately, you have to make something, ultimately, your business needs to be financially viable, ultimately, you have to make sure that you have the energy to run through because it's a long process. Uh, and, and to make sure that you have the resources. So there's really five things. So in some ways it's simple uh, at that level, but in other ways, that simplicity looks different from everyone. And it's, you got every, everybody has to go through the motions. So it's a very, very exciting journey to be, to be part of. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be working with uh, Stathis and Eddie. So thank you. Thank you, Dimo. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Nigel. Let's stay in UK. Thank you, Manina. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't wish to repeat what Dima was just saying, but to uh, totally agree with the comments there. Um, I'm working with Miguel, with Visualist, um, and I've learned a lot. 
as I'm not from the media space, but I've been working with uh, small companies, startups uh, for the last 12 years. And it, it's been, a, from my perspective, uh, a two-way uh, process of my learning and my uh, hopefully ability to support Miguel, particularly as he's looking to raise funding and prepare for that. And I think there's a lot of challenges that uh, early stage companies have in achieving the, the funding beyond the friends and family rounds, where you have to be very precise, very focused on talking to the audience of investors. They want to know immediately how much you wish to uh, have invested, what their return's going to be, what the market is, and particularly picking up on Demo's point, uh, um, what is your market? What is your product? What's your pricing? And is it profitable? And I think very much understanding your cost base and how much it takes to get a product to market. It's not just its manufacture. It's just not a technical build. It's the marketing and all the management overheads that you have uh, and the professional support that you need along the way um, that needs to be incorporated in what you're presenting to them and how you're actually going to make a profit. So it's been, it's been great working with Miguel, uh, very experienced uh, in the industry and bringing a, a solution to market that he observed that was holding his industry back. So it's been, been great to participate, Malena. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. We will certainly go back to this key question and main challenge, of course, of how to attract the investors. What they're looking for and this is the time to ask all the participants uh, interrupt a little bit before I give the word to the other coaches in our program. May I ask how many of you uh, are representing investors here among the participants? Maybe you can just put it in the chat or if you would like to share because we started, started talking already about investors. Thank you. Vladimir just uh, oh, yeah. waved. It's you, okay. Vladimir. Yes, we represent yeah. uh, various investors here in Bulgaria, also some uh, coming from abroad. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so may I ask you who is coming from uh, startup scale? Hi, so that would be me okay. uh, representing Sesame, okay. we'll a parking we'll startup. We'll talk about you guys later. Thank you. Sure. I see Stefan is already here. Alex Grancharov. Yeah, great, right, mate. Okay. We have employee. I saw somebody representing. Okay, we will yep. hear about you, of Hello. course. We have Growwise, Adi. Okay, Constantine. Okay, hi. Great, great. great yeah, to nice to meet you. I'm representing today. employee. I'm doing the product management and uh, marketing uh, here. Perfect. Yes, we'll give you the word uh, in the in the fourth uh, session after having the discussion now. Okay, let's proceed and going back to Ruslan, who is uh, another coach from our program. Uh, he was uh, the coach of Adhash in the first support cycle, very successful, uh, very, how to say, liked startup. We are very happy that uh, most of our uh, international partners uh, showed interest in their business. They have been really, really great participants with great success. Ruslan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Milena. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, indeed, great success. I claim nothing of it, so uh, I'll just <laughs> sh share of course, uh, yeah, part, in it. <laughs> a part of the experience. Uh, a brief introduction of myself. Uh, Ruslan uh, is my name, Ruslan Popazian. I'm uh, heading uh, the team of Telelink Infra Services. This is a um, technology organization and integrative technologies, which includes uh, telecommunication, automation. Um, I have previous experience with uh, manufacturing. So as you can see, I'm a bit in line with what Nigel and uh, Dimo are saying. It's uh, 
it's a diverse experience background that uh, potentially can contribute. Again, I claim no contribution, but uh, <laughs> let's not overstress. No. Now, the, um, the, the perspectives which are actually, uh, again, uh, companies are having, uh, there are a few major uh, points where, where additional input and an external view are beneficial. And uh, at least I have been trying to really um, uh, make sure that when uh, discussing with the team of AdHash or any other uh, starting organization, uh, we come to a point where these major points are brought up. I mean, we have mentioned marketing, we have mentioned the product, we have mentioned the organization, the team, the processes, anything which is above uh, several people goes into a mode of where you need really these parts of a, of a large organization. And I think anyone with the, with some experience uh, has has um, the potential to contribute with the goodwill and good understanding of the situation of the team that one is discussing with. Um, and and it's about time. I mean, I had a I had a good mentor and I really respected one. And he once said, "Look, I mean, there are two types of problems. One is uh, such that um, only time can uh, resolve." And the other type of problem is the ones that uh, not even time can resolve. So <laughs> we, we, we are not really, I mean, as an executive, I, I, I didn't have the luxury of dealing the, with problems in such a way. So, I mean, you have to apply some common knowledge, uh, basic experience. And I, and I think um, uh, startups, irrespective of uh, how big or small they are, can benefit from experience from a large organization from which I have experience. Uh, we, we have mentioned the perspective of investors. Yes, uh, usually also uh, such experience will bring the perspective of an investor. Uh, not least because either these companies are investing themselves or they are the object of very uh, intensive scrutiny from their investors, if, especially if it's a public company, if it's, a, if it's an organization that is up for sale or any other larger process of transferring of ownership. So this is another uh, object, I think, which one has to be aware that there is experience and it's a good experience and it's widely applicable. I mean, I have seen it widely applicable when you talk to investors and how you do that and what topics you bring up. And last but not least, I would like to bring up the topic of what large organizations um, and um, uh, how, how would it benefit a startup and a scale up to understand the uh, large organization and the challenges uh, that it has? Because you probably have noticed there are a number of large organizations which are developing uh, so-called internal um, incubators, uh, uh, places where they would like to uh, attract and develop companies and they are willing to uh, obviously invest directly into the companies but also provide additional administrative support, uh, basic even uh, facilities as um, uh, offices and uh, space where one can interact. And, and it's interesting also to look into this perspective and to understand these companies, why are they doing it? And it's a, it's a challenging world for, for, a, for a large organization right now. I mean, there are a lot of disruptive, uh, uh, so to say, uh, events around large organizations and um, really they value and benefit and look for and intensively look for uh, cooperation and uh, I say cooperation, not investing, not uh, mentoring, but the cooperation with nimble, innovative, uh, so to say, uh, fast thinking uh, teams uh, where they can invigorate, uh, so to say, the sometimes sleeping uh, entrepreneurial spirit within the organization, the large organization, and obviously uh, explore new development areas which have not been obvious before to the organization. So I hope these, uh, I, I noted a few points and uh, I hope these, uh, should say, develop a few thoughts where one can think and, and really invest time as a startup to, to investigate and to get a feeling about. And obviously such programs, and again, thanks Milena and the team for inviting me and for uh, making me a part of this uh, successful organization is uh, one way to do that is uh, through such programs. So excellent, thank you.
Thank you too. Thank you, Roslan, and thank you for uh, uh, introducing the first topic that we can elaborate on. That's a very good point, and that's uh, again one of the main goals of this program uh, is uh, so-called uh, matchmaking or finding the right contacts uh, as lead clients, customers, and partners for the startups. Uh, this is uh, the, one of our indicators and key success factors. So now I would like to go back to the startups and hear their opinion about it. Uh, what would you guys benefit? Uh, how much would you like to cooperate? And uh, in our initial discussion, we use the word to attach to a large corporation. Would you like to share your thoughts? Uh, I know that uh, some of you already had such experience like the guys from uh, Envision, maybe studies you would like to share something with us from your experience working with larger organizations? Sure, sure. Yes, I think um, it's definitely a very interesting space, obviously being able to um, work and partner with a large organization uh, from the validation point of view. I think it's important to understand also the, the life cycle of a business of a startup, right? So. For us specifically, because we are quite early on, so for us getting feedback from uh, a potential cu a customer or prospect early on in our journey was super important. And this is why we've been trying to optimize this um, sort of feedback loop, trying to be able to get feedback as, as soon as possible. And uh, since uh, we've done an accelerator program before, so during the summer and autumn last year, so we worked with a media company before from Germany, um, so it was that was the first sort of introduction to this kind of partnership. And um, I want to emphasize that the biggest problem uh, on these kind of collaborations and partnerships is trying to manage expectations and requirements from the partners. Obviously, each startup has their own roadmap, their own vision of what they want to build. Uh, engaging in conversations with uh, any customer, I think, but in, in particular, like larger organizations, they have their own agendas and their own requirements. I think find this alignment point in terms of uh, what it is valuable for both parties. It is super critical, especially for early stage companies. And I think there is always this um, easy thing to say, yes, we can do everything as a startup to get the first partner going. But I think in our, on our end, I think this wasn't necessarily the approach. So we're trying to stick as much as possible to what is our roadmap and try to, to say sometimes no as well. Uh, to partners that they they wanted to work on a consulting project or on a smaller project. So I think there is an element of um, trade-offs in terms of what it is that is valuable for the startup and also how you can create a more long-term relationship uh, with a company like an organize larger organization or enterprise. Thank you, Stadis. Uh, and I just saw, and I'm happy to welcome also Alex from DBA. Hi, Alex. Ah. Hey, guys. Uh, yeah, Hi. sorry. I actually, I actually somehow put um, two o'clock in my calendar, but now I'm here and ready to answer all of your questions or yeah. all yeah. of the potential questions. I'm sorry, uh, but now I'm here. That's fine. It happens all the time with different time zones. Uh, I would like just to ask to say a few words about DPA, which is uh, one of the more developed startups in the program. Maybe some words about yourself. Uh, you yeah, sure. So uh, we're DPA. We're a startup from Freiburg in southern Germany. And um, what we do is we have developed an AI platform uh, an AI recognition platform basically for um, computer vision. Um, so we extract metadata from videos and images, face recognition, um, landmark recognition, object recognition, etc. And we were founded in 2018 and already have our first customers, our first projects. So we're not um, at the very beginning, um, but have made a little bit of progress in the last two or three years. Alex, you got muted, maybe. Oh, sorry. Alex, you're <laughs> yeah, mic. sorry. Uh, so my colleague uh, Florian and I were work working in marketing and sales department, or uh, better yet, we're trying to establish those departments, so to say. We're 
trying to develop marketing and sales processes and really build up those, um, those areas. And we have worked together with uh, Ves Stoyanov or Veselin uh, Stoyanov. And he uh, had quite a, a lot of useful tips for us. So we have made an agenda concerning our, so we're launching a new website, for example, and we have worked on that topic. Uh, he has given us a lot of tips in terms of um, sales prog uh, processes and uh, cold acquisition as well, since that is always a topic which is difficult, you know. And uh, he has given quite a lot of advice um, in terms of that. And uh, he was quite helpful. We got along pretty well. So that was a cornerstone of MME for us. And also the workshops so far have been super interesting for us. And um, we really uh, took a lot of information from that as well. And I think, yeah, I think so far the progress in MME has really, yeah, really um, has given us a lot of information on, you know, quite a few topics. Thank you, Alex. Uh, and maybe just to bring some uh, clarification regarding the process, uh, this uh, particular support cycle started back in uh, January, so they have been already halfway through uh, the support cycle ending in June, and I'm really glad to hear very positive feedback, uh, all of you guys. Uh, and one more thing, the Celine Stoyanov is Wes, he's uh, here, but unfortunately experiencing some internet uh, connection problems. Wes, would you like to give it a try? I, I sure will. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm actually lucky enough uh, to be uh, on my vacation right now near the Luxor area in Egypt. And my hotel here is doing their best to offer me a uh, fast internet connection, but at this time of the day, a lot of people were back in their rooms, um, you know, for their siesta. So it's kind of slow. I'm hope I'm certainly not interrupting too much. And I'm going to cut my very long Oscar speech talk. Just, <laughs> we can just hear you it. very well. Don't worry. Yeah. The connection is good it's, so far. Uh, that can change very, very fast. I, I missed okay. like the first 10 minutes of that presentation was breaking up so badly. And now it's fantastic, but that can change. So a um, short message, thumbs up to everybody in Media Motor Europe, yourself, Milana as well, for, for what's essentially a great experience. Uh, for me, and thank you, Alex, uh, for the good words. That's something that I, I did totally enjoy as a process as well. Um, I tried to, you know, help the guys there as uh, as much as as possible, and to really give them the perspective of uh, the other side, the heavy corporation on the other end, because I think in your messaging and your delivery, it's so much important to put yourself. Um, in the shoes of others in that in that sense what could be a little bit more difficult for a startup or a scale up to imagine a company uh, that has 25,000 or even 50,000 plus employees and what could be the you know incentives and what could be the ways inside in terms of you know messaging approach in the sales process so I, I certainly try to put a big emphasis on that and most of all uh, I, I did I did learn a lot as well in the process, and that's that's really important for me. So, guys, um, looking forward, um, you know, to our next interaction together. And oh. I'll be wishing you all a good day for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Uh, Thank you for this, and uh, as I promised, I would like to uh, ask uh, Michael to share a bit of his uh, story that was very interesting, and I would say the first uh, support cycle and his participation was like a roller coaster, but you can tell us more, and just a quick question, uh, are you still in the US right now? Yes, I'm actually in New York City now. Great. Uh, I'll be heading Yes, back. we covered three continents so far. Do we yes. have anyone from Asia logging in today? 
No, okay. So we are still at, on three continents, which is great. Okay, Michael, tell us. Uh, it's very interesting uh, because the program nearly helped him, as he uh, explained. But maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on what Ruslan said regarding the internal organization and building the team and the processes in order to scale your business. So you can tell us how you plan to overcome this barrier. You mentioned something about an MBA program and uh, partnership also with the university, which is very interesting because initially this was not the purpose of the program. We have been looking for uh, media corporation and organizations from the creative industry, but at the end, uh, he ended up having a, a good collaboration with the university. So you can tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. Uh, one thing that's a little different. Yeah, one thing that's a little different about my approach to this company is that uh, pretty much I, I had written down all the ideas about what are some of the future of media exchanging uh, programmatically happening, and it was submitted as a patent, and I was waiting for it to come back, and it came back um, right as I was starting the Media Motor Europe program with positive results, and so that actually was part of a cause of creating a rift between me and my co-founders at the time, uh, that and COVID, I would say, in terms of what we need to do, how we want to approach the industry. Um, and we were going to be ready to test um, and just, you know, things fell behind and it really turned out that there was a deeper issue about, uh, let's say, people's views on strategy and motivation. You might be able to tell I'm being very uh, politically correct here. You know, I'm trying to say like the very nice way to talk about a difficult situation. And, you know, when, when co-founders split up, it's, it's a thing that happens. And I was worried thinking, oh my God, is Media Motor Europe going to kick me out? Like what's going to happen? But, but we just had a nice meeting and I just showed uh, what I was committed to and, and what the goals were. And, um, and again, part of this was, it was more about how do we prototype the concepts that were in this patent and how do we forge these partnerships and I think one perspective change was um, when you had said, just look at everyone else in Media Motor Europe. They're all here, talk to them, meet them. So that was definitely helpful. Um, let's see, you were also asking about the, the shift into the academic. So yeah, what, what I'm still working on now is getting the sort of the fundraising to have the developers. So it was kind of like a flip in the order of the process. Um, and so far that's actually going really well, but yeah, at one point I thought, okay, we're here in Europe. We're doing, we're trying to do this the way that's, uh, very progressive in terms of data policy. But if I'm just trying to get these metrics about user experiences and seeing how much we can monetize people, we're going to miss this potential about how our local regions deciding who sees which content, how are data collectives and people individually deciding um what data is allowed to be used for them and you know part of my challenges always are that i can be very let's say expansive i could uh think of bigger ideas and, and need to be uh more focused so uh, that's part of the benefit of the accelerator program at some point they're like you know michael you gotta you gotta bring this to a landing you have to figure out how to make this practical um uh, but it was it was sort of um more of a supportive stance it's not like it's not like a teacher that you have to hand your assignment into it's more uh you know we're here with resources let's have this conversation how do you want to help and i found my uh my relationship to pedro Rosero, my um my coach had been very helpful and we still keep in touch uh, you know the program is over for me but it is still continuing with um just the meetings that we have and the support so he had connected me to a university professor and she's, as I said, teaching two MBA programs. And so they're looking at you know, the sort of media transactions, the market growth. Um, one of the things we're looking at is how is this method of exchanging media beneficial or how could it be bad if a government or region decides to use it for purposes that aren't uh, as helpful? And these are things that just wouldn't happen in a typical start off like there's not really that level of of thinking necessarily when you're just doing the work to get the next you know monthly revenue or or user activity so that's why when i think of europe up uh, so i'm i'm american and i'm italian uh so dual citizen i see a lot of these perspectives and i think that europe's benefit really is that 
there is this societal vision. There's this, this sort of push to have AI and to have this technology, but not to sort of overtake. And I do think that the US is following in that position. Uh, and I think that there is an evolution, especially with the new administration. But it's really nice to see that Europe cares, that Europe is trying to make these new pathways. And I see it in a lot of the other companies that are also in this program. Thank you, Michael. That's been very helpful. And uh, I hope uh, everyone uh, agrees with you. And uh, we are not going into this discussion, uh, EU against, uh, sorry, EU against US, but more of the dynamics between EU and US. And uh, I would like to go into finalizing. First of all, are there any questions from our participants? Any thoughts, suggestions, maybe comments, ideas that popped up in your mind? No, nothing to share? Okay, so... Hi, excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I uh, joined the conversation a little bit later. I missed sure. the first 20 minutes. Yeah, but uh, first of all, thank you for everything. I'm very interested and I'm probably going to contact uh, a lot of you here. Uh, what I'm developing in a few words is a cloud-based visualization and person 3D personalization platform. So a, a lot of the discussions here directly apply to me intellectual property, uh, structuring of, of communications and marketing, all of this, this is something which is ahead of my company. And uh, I will be looking for communications with, uh, with you. This is great. So we have one inspired participant. This is a good KPI. Can we achieve 10 of you today? Yes, you can achieve one more maybe. Okay. Everyone. <laughs> we are back in the States, I see. <laughs> yeah, I um, have yeah, from the United States as well. Uh, and um, as an academic person, uh, I'm inspired in uh, these uh, presentations. And um, I think I'll contact some of uh, participants as well because uh, we are working in. Um, uh, level of the IT and uh, cultural heritage and combination with this is uh, very will be very powerful applying some of the presented ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I just realized that uh, it should be early in the morning for you and Michael, right? Seven hours behind. So it's a good, a good kickoff of your day, I hope. Uh, no, it is so almost in the middle. For me, I start at 2.30. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. Yeah, it's almost the 8 o'clock here in New York. Yeah, life of entrepreneurs and academic. Okay, and I'm going to shoot one last question to everyone here. And I think it, it's supposed to be a million dollar question is, how do you scale your business and how do you find investment? <laughs> Nigel can start here, maybe, hopefully. I'd actually like, in answering that one, picking up on the point Michael made just now, that in bringing his thoughts together and putting the business together and refocusing, a very key element you mentioned there, Michael, was having that feedback from those around you to focus and be and, and not distracted by all the other noise that goes on around you as to where you might be able to take your product getting your product to market and uh, getting your solution to market first and achieving those first revenues um, focus is, is always very important thank you uh, Nigel so how do we scale how do we grow our businesses it's, well, sorry, yeah, picking up on that, that, that focus is important because by getting to market and achieving those first revenues, it makes any conversation with an investor so much more positive and productive. Uh, and hopefully Miguel in a moment will also mention that as he's trying to get his product to be piloted and feedback, demonstrating revenue, it, it makes the conversation with, with the investor community so much easier they'll back you, you can start growing, and then you can start exploring some of the other distractions that will always note them, but they don't get distracted. 
money attracts money when they see the yeah. revenue they would like to invest in your company is this the, i but see it, adding, but it, <laughs> adding it proves you've got a market <laughs> it proves that you've got a product and that you're in it selling and hopefully generating a profit thank you and the big question remains is yes we know what but it's really really hard to get to the how <laughs> Adi, do you agree? <laughs> Sorry? Adi, I'm asking Adi, I see that she's smiling and she's nodding and agreeing with me, I hope, or disagreeing, yeah. You guys are also at the early stage of development of your business, uh, which will bring us to the next part. Are there any other comments, questions before we proceed? To, yeah, uh, well, uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Please go uh, ahead. It's uh, very good that for every... Um, investors uh, um, uh, to see uh, about your clear strategies. Very simple steps, but to be clear on the goals and the results that you, you achieve in, um, after every step. Then uh, when they see that uh, you're following your plan for development, uh, they can follow you and backing you with, um, with funds. Also some other support, not only funding, but there are many other things are necessary for you to, to grow. But uh, uh, if you have a clear strategy for development, uh, it will be very, very clear for uh, all your partners uh, where you go and uh, how, what you want to, to achieve. Well, thank you. Thank you. And this is bringing us to the stars the rising startup in Bulgaria. Uh, the next part we're going to see here uh, and get introduced uh, to new applicants to our program, I hope. And I would suggest to start with uh, the first uh, lady so far that will join us as startup, Adi from GrowWise to share their experience, your story. And I have one question to all of you guys. Uh, what do you need? What could we do for you? In some ideal world and ideal circumstances, if you meet the goldfish, what are your wishes? Adi, so let you me can share your screen. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Milena. First of all, I'm Adi and I'm a co founder at GrowWise. And I'd like to thank uh, for the chance to, to speak in front of everyone and meet so many people. Uh, in short, GrowWise is a SaaS startup helping hospitality venues such as bars, pubs, cafes, run their business from their mobile phones on the go from anywhere at any time. GrowWise provides workflow automation for these venues, making the life of owners and managers easier as well as their day-to-day -day customers much simpler. What is our ultimate goal is to actually make their operations smarter, more efficient through image and voice recognition, OCR, machine learning, artificial intelligence, allowing managers to spend more time with their customers rather than waste time in the office doing boring admin work. I've, we, we've got a very, very short video which I'm going to share with you right now. And this video we did, when was that about? January last year with very limited resources. I think all of you guys know how it is in the very beginning. We really struggled uh, with our own resources. So we gathered friends, freelancers to help us build this video, which I'm going to share with you right now. Just give me a sec. Okay, do you see the screen? Yeah. Yes, Adi. Okay. <clears throat> We sit through data input okay. and human effort. As a manager in hospitality, you strive to grow sales, minimize costs, and maximize profits. But huge amounts of your time is wasted on daily operational tasks instead of strategic decision making. So, what if you could eliminate unnecessary paperwork, repetitive data input, and human error to reduce business losses? Welcome to GrowWise. Our cloud-based solution is the all-in-one tool you need to succeed. Using the most advanced machine learning and AI technologies, GrowWise helps you automate processes, increase employee productivity, and grow your business wisely. 
Simply scan a document, whether a delivery note or invoice, and with just one click, notify your suppliers of any discrepancies. Being in the cloud, data is accessible anywhere you are. Create bespoke alerts and reports, and monitor your losses on the go. How about using our mobile app to record waste and stock take? Just scan the item, enter the quantity and reason, and confirm. Images are saved as evidence for as long as you need. Quick and easy. Our business intelligence tool brings data together from all operational channels, giving you visibility, transparency, and control. Use our mobile app for an easy stock take. Monitor your stock levels and losses at any time, from any place. Simplicity, ease of use, immediacy of data, and intelligent reporting helps you grow your business wisely. So, keep an eye on your margins and defend your bottom line with GrowWise. Probably you've noticed that um, we did change our branding since then, and uh, we had so here to. Goes. Oh, sorry, and just give me a sec to stop soaps. the other videos. Uh, one second. It's like a soap opera. Yep. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Everything is fine. So we we did change our branding in the meantime because it wasn't looking as fancy as now. Probably uh, you can see the background. We're trying to do our best uh, with our designers. Um, just a brief intro. We are three co-founders from Bulgaria with Growwise based in London. Our technology team is based in Bulgaria. We've been really, really lucky to have managed to raise investment from angel investors just before the pandemic hit us, which actually for us has been really good because we managed to, to focus on building our software and we've already managed to also complete our initial beta testing. In the UK, we had to be really agile and I'm happy to say that uh, we've had amazing feedback in London and a few other parts in the UK from um, owners and managers of bars and pubs. Uh, at this point, we, we are aiming to soft launch around mid-June and start attracting our first paying customers to actually begin a process of looking for a bigger chunk of investment. And one last sentence, uh, at this stage, at this moment, uh, as you know, I mean, our tech team is developing the software, but we are working very hard on establishing processes flows, working heavily on marketing and building our website, which is how, which we want to be our 24 seven engine of attracting leads and then converting them to, to customers. It, it needs to be a machine and as you know, you know, it's, uh, it's, you need to put a lot of effort to, to get to that stage. Uh, this is a quick brief for me, but please, if you have any questions, uh, do get in touch and uh, it would, I would be happy to connect with anyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adi. This has been a great uh, example. And uh, can we conclude that uh, COVID didn't stop you, but helped you to develop your product and gave you some time with all lockdown and stopping of the business, which is your target group? So is it a positive? It gave us a lot. On you? It gave yeah. us a lot of focus, but in the meantime, with all the lockdowns in the UK, we had to be very agile when to when to launch, what to do. Uh, also, pub, pub, pub managers and bar, bar managers, they we had to know when exactly to approach them, because before before the when the lockdown would finish, they obviously would be very busy or just before that. So we had to to play a lot with timing, but. Uh, it gave us focus mostly. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I saw that uh, in the chat already, uh, we've been exchanging some uh, emails uh, and profiles maybe on LinkedIn. So I encourage you all, if you're interested in contacting anyone from the participants here or just in general to prov provide your email, again, the profile on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to do so. You know, nowadays, and it's been the eternal truth that networking, networking, and networking is everything, and the best deals are actually happening during a glass of wine or whiskey while networking with people. So I encourage you to exchange contacts and use these opportunities. We are 54 people now online. Uh, and I would like to give the floor to Rate Mate. 
to hear about their story and about their platform for sharing opinion and decision making. Stefan, I see, I see you now. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Milena. Hi, Hello, welcome. everyone. Welcome. Can you hear me well? Yeah. All right, super. So it's a really a great honor to be, uh, you know, be able to share with you our story, uh, to see so many successful people here. And uh, it's, it's nice to have such events despite the pandemics. So today I have, uh, we have prepared, so we are present all the three founders, myself, Stefan, uh, Krasimir and uh, Vesela, we're all here. I know many of you from before, we've seen each other. So I would like to, uh, you know, present quickly. Uh, give me a. I would like to share my screen. Sure. Give no me a second. We start the video. I share screen. Host, host disabled participants screen sharing. So I'm. Ah, you're uh, disabled. Is it, yeah. uh, is it possible to give me the right? Yes. Yes. May I ask our colleagues from BCCI to assist here and give him the rights to share the screen? Would you try again? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes? Okay. I think it's so. One second. So, can you see the screen? Yes. Can, all right, super. So, uh, looking at the screen, you see RateMate, and you're most probably asking yourself the question what is this? What is it all about? Well, um, I would like to start with a quick story. And that's the story of Lisa, without a doubt, the story of many of you. So Lisa, like many other times, is in the supermarket, supermarket wondering, wondering what me to try. In the freezer section, she saw the pizza with the nice and tasty looking at, the one that she saw the day before and bought the pizza. Back at home, Lisa baked the pizza and sat on the nicely set table. She was so hungry, but that didn't help much. First bite and ooh. Disgusting. Once again, she felt misguided. Bloody ads, she mumbled and reached for the fridge. It would be a scrambled X again. The good old back, the good old backup that never disappoints. Later that night, while scrolling through the newsfeed in Facebook, she came upon an app called Ratemate. Give it a thumb up or down, it said. It's never been easier. Well, Lisa installed it. A few days later, she was in the same situation. She recalled RateMate and browsed through the content. The pizza Lisa tried that night had a crappy rating. The one that was on top, she never heard of. She hesitated for a while, but in the end decided to trust RateMate. Back at home, again, nicely set table, pizza out of the oven, and boom, this is it. Lisa gave a big thumb up the good pizza and a big thumb down the bad one. By doing this, she helped many others the same way they helped her that day. So I believe the story sounds familiar to many of you. So why did we launch the one and only platform for rating of food and beverage products? Well, mainly to provide answers to the following questions. Is the opinion of every customer important? Is public taste subjective? Can we all agree or agree to disagree on the value for money of food and beverage? The MVP validation stage and the 6,000 ratings from our 1,000 users clearly showed us that the answer to the previous questions is positive and that every opinion matters. <clears throat> a collective and informed society is a happier one because you are what you eat, aren't you? But what is the main problem? We see it this way. People lack an adequate, unbiased, and centralized information source to help them take purchasing decisions. We are all literally overwhelmed by the infinite amount of food and beverages. And while in the supermarket, while staring at the shelves, most of us surely ask the question, is this product, product worthy? Is it any good? Is it overpriced? What should I buy in the end? While well, we, the founders of RateMate, were and still are in the shoes of that confused customer, we believe that a solution can be achieved by building a unified community-oriented online platform 
to enable users to share opinions, leave reviews, and rate the quality and price of food and beverage products. This will not only improve consumer experience, but also encourage a healthier competition. It's all about the digitalization of the word of mouth, the simplest yet the most effective and unbiased way of passing information to others. It is about creating a platform that helps us take more informed, diverse and adequate purchasing decisions. And that platform is called Rademate. Three words define, define our product. First, simplicity with seamless navigation, transparency, letting people clearly see what others think, and freedom, letting people share what they think. And to wrap up, Rademate is all about enabling people to take quick and adequate decisions over the tip of your thumb. Again, quickly, that's the team so far three of us, three founders. And thank you very much. That's, that's for me. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Stefan. And I would encourage everyone to use it. We can just download it, the app. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. Ratemate.eu. You can put the link, yes. And yeah, you put can it. put the link to, yes, any links and any information in the chat so all of us can use it. Mm, I see that we are a bit behind with the timing, so let's keep the promise from the beginning, be precise and concise. So we are moving to Sesame, the next startup, uh, Anton. And I will ask you to... Yeah, yeah hi. Thank you. Hey, hi. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Feel free to share your screen and okay. the floor is yours. In the meanwhile, if anyone from the participants have gained some questions, maybe some uh, inspirations or ideas, you can just put them in the chat. Okay, go okay, ahead. Okay, so this is Sesame. It's a, it's a parking platform which uh, uh, we have the goal to rethink the urban parking. So let's... Let's go to my <laughs> to my presentation. So this is an old uh, an old uh, 2013 study uh, from the European Association, European Parking Association. Basically, it found out that there are uh, there are big amounts about uh, half of the parking spaces in in uh, in cities are actually off street parking spaces. Um, which are not utilized um, and our goal is to uh, make them uh, to make them ut utilized so people can use them um, basically in, in bulgaria we uh, as most places in eastern europe uh, there is very interesting uh, solution to the problem of people parking at your space it's uh, we put barriers everywhere on every parking uh, what we did is um, uh, we uh, decided to make a platform that is going to solve the problem with the barriers. And um, there is, if you have, if you can solve the problem with the barriers um, and easy access to some to some place, uh, you can make um, parking sharing uh, or parking uh, renting easier and more accessible to drivers. So basically we, we want to make the parking at uh, a shared uh, parking space as easy as parking on the street in a, in a high density urban area. So we build our solution. It's a parking management platform. Um, and basically it's, uh, it's easy to invite the people who use uh, any parking uh, which has a barrier and the invitation is as simple as sending them a web link or um, sending them email from the platform um, and any office building or residential building that has parking space can onboard the drivers who use that parking space during the day um, and when when these guys leave uh, the the space they can offer their parking space for sharing by the public let's say 
So this is uh, a little demo of the app. It's uh, how it's working. Um, you can download it uh, right now. There's only private beta. It's a big green button that uh, shows up when you're right in front of the barrier. When you click it, the barrier will open and you have time to, to move to your place, to find the parking spot. And when you're back and you want to go out of the, of the parking lot, you get the same button again to exit. And again, uh, the other barrier will open and you have, uh, you have completed this uh, parking uh, experience. So the, the key here is that, um, that uh, we have uh, already installed the solution in already uh, two parking lots with totaling seven barriers. Uh, we are a fully completed team and we, we, are build, we have launched the beta in, in the end of last year. Um, so we think that the benefits of a parking management platform is first, um, that you have no hassle parking access for everybody. Um, this is basically a re supposed to replace the plastic cart or the tickets that we use on every parking space. Uh, right now we are focusing on a parking management uh, platform for businesses, which is office buildings and residential places. So uh, in high, area urban areas and high density urban areas we want to enable renting and a p2p marketplace so when your space goes unused uh, you can share it with the public which is struggling to find parking um, for 2021 uh, we have basically uh, we are based in sofia so uh, we want to find uh, business partners which means uh, contact uh, more office buildings uh, or spaces, uh, parking lots, uh, so we can expand the SESAM network and uh, make it easier for private buildings uh, to have better parking management, parking access. Um, so basically ditch the plastic cards and use the SESAM application. And in the future, we want to reach uh, a stage where we can provide sharing economy, which would mean that we want to integrate digital wallets uh, and integrate with other mobility uh, solutions out there. Uh, you can contact me um, on LinkedIn or uh, you can go to our website, sesamapp.eu and basically that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe uh, you can add the website in the chat and put uh, your uh, profile on LinkedIn here so people can connect uh, and uh, hopefully sure. find the right partners. And uh, now as uh, the clock is ticking, we are giving the floor to Fitinch, uh, bringing us to the world of uh, fashion which is very relevant today, having the Oscars just a few days ago happening and having all the good uh, impressions and feedback about the dress of Maria. <laughs> so I guess it's a nice touch. Alex, the floor is yours. You can tell us more about Fit Inch. You. Let's hear your story. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Goncharov. Uh, I'm a doctor and engineer in uh, artificial intelligence for industrial application. And um, I would like to introduce to you uh, FitInch, an e-commerce platform where clothing always fits. Uh, the whole thing started uh, with uh, actually my co-founder, Vaselena, who has a successful uh, brand of her own. And uh, a client uh, walked into her store and said, wouldn't be uh, very nice if there was a place where you could go and see all the clothes that uh, that will fit you, you know, without going on different stores and trying a bunch of things. Uh, and the thing is that designers today have hundreds of tools to predict what color shirt you will buy next year, but they don't have a single one to predict whether it will fit you. And um, 
Uh, sizing problem started actually long ago with a not very well thought out upper sizing system. Um, actually, a lot of people think that uh, they are, if they, for example, are size, size large, you know, L for one brand, then they are the same L size everywhere. And that is not true. Uh, sizes are absolutely brand specific. Uh, not only that, but they are also, um, they vary extremely uh, a lot in countries and on continents. Um, and today with uh, globalization and the single market efforts, uh, it has terrifying cost, um, a very costly effect on the fashion industry. So uh, 2019, since this is the last um, lot of data we have, uh, companies in the US alone Alex, lost more than 300 billion. Alex, Alex, just a quick thing. Um, would you move your, maybe the mic or uh, closer to, you're cutting off a little bit. And we're losing you. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's your mic or if it's the connection. Sorry for interrupting you, but we can't hear you very well. That's strange. Um, we just switch them to. We, we don't hear you now. Okay. Um, can you hear me now better? Yes. Um, I switched to the. Um, I assume, okay. so, yes, so yes, thank um, you. Maybe the batteries of the phones, you know, <laughs> this has been for a long um, Okay, so for 2019, the, um, uh, the apparel business, uh, the industry has lost almost $300 billion in uh, returned orders. And about 52% of these were due to sizing issues. Uh, and half of these uh, actually became waste because either they're not uh, sellable again after they're returned or they're too cheap to, you know, the, to cover the return cost. So um, it's not only, you know, the direct financial cost, but also this has led to loss of reputation for brands, loss of uh, customer retention, customer satisfaction, which again can be translated into financial loss down the line. Uh, and for the end customer, again, um, it's a significant problem because uh, you have to return it. That's a loss of money and time. Uh, and for women specifically, it's uh, very often a loss of self-esteem uh, if they don't, uh, you know, then they don't match the, the size they think they are. Um, so we want to create a marketplace where in a, uh, in a body positive atmosphere, women will purchase clothes not according to some brand specific size tag, but according to their own body measurements and, uh, and shape. And so for the past few years, we've been working hard to create our proprietary matchmaking algorithm. Uh, and we are happy to say that uh, so far we have achieved the 94% uh, success in matching uh, clothes to women bodies. Uh, we are using the raw data from the apparel manufacturers and the data from our customers to make that match together with a lot of other details, which I'm not going to talk about at the moment. Um, the whole business is uh, dressed in two, in two business lines, you can say. So we have the, our platform, our marketplace, uh, which is a two-sided marketplace, bringing the fashion brands and the customers together uh, in a B2B2C model. And of course, we also have the algorithm as a pure B2B software as a service solution, which we uh, offer to other fashion brands for third party stores, et cetera. Um, I have a lot of slides here about, you know, revenues and um, competition. Uh, we can talk about that uh, if, you, if you would like to, you know, ask questions about it, because it's probably interesting. Uh, we've already, mm, started uh, attracting brands for the marketplace. Uh, we started with independent designers. Uh, we have some uh, interest for the software as a service solution by a few uh, bigger brands. Now, initially we're targeting the US market because it's, uh, we think most diverse in terms of uh, races and mixed marriages and thus body types. Uh, we made a list of segments to target in terms of social demographic characteristics. And uh, I would like to share with you our traction actually so far. So uh, we've been active for about six months so far. Uh, we have a working uh, 
prototype of the platform. It's not nearly uh, as good as we want it to be, obviously, because uh, we built it to test the algorithm. But even, even in that state, we managed to acquire 10 brands uh, to join. We have already um, finished uh, 200 orders and we have quite a few customers. And the, the algorithm is working really, really great. We are currently in negotiations with some bigger brands to uh, work on the on those um, pilot projects for the software as a service. We are building the API for the communication with their systems. So we're uh, actually uh, doing quite well. Um, that's uh, basically it. Um, we can talk a lot about uh, this problem because we think it's a really serious problem. Um, what we are looking for either by uh, medium motor Europe or by any other means is of course investment because we want to scale faster than we are currently uh, doing. And uh, we also need uh, partners. We need mostly partners in terms of uh, fashion companies who have a strong online presence and who are you know, ready to, to give us um, a try to see if uh, we can uh, decrease their uh, returns loss. Uh, the team, it's um, Vesalena, my co-founder, who unfortunately couldn't be here. And uh, myself, uh, as I said, she has a, a long time uh, experience in the fashion industry, has studied uh, fashion technology and economics, both in Bulgaria and Spain and in the US. Uh, I myself, um, I have a, quite a bit of experience uh, with uh, marketing. Before that, I had an advertising agency for a long time. I had a few other businesses. Uh, I am also um, uh, assistant professor at the Technical University, and as I said, I have a PhD in AI for industrial application. And the other part of the team, uh, we have Peter, our uh, IT, who is uh, mostly working on the platform, Dan, who is helping us with the uh, contacts with the industry, with the bigger brands, and uh, of course, Lily, who is uh, our uh, industry advisor she's helping us navigate the trends in the fashion industry um i am open to any uh no question you, that you might have thank you thank you very much alex it's been really interesting you truly involved us in the fashion uh, and uh, started dreaming about dress of course all about dresses and dressing up. So uh, if you would like to share again your contacts uh, in the chat, feel free to do so. Uh, finding the right partners, uh, as we already discussed, is a key uh, for success. And now I'm happy to give the floor to employ, last but not least, uh, Constantin is here. He will present because we've been talking about scaling up the business, growing the company. It's all about people and finding the right team and yep. keeping the right team. As we heard from Michael, it's challenging if you don't keep the team and you end up alone at some point. So Constantine will tell us more. Yeah. Hello. Uh, nice to meet you all. I'm Constantine. I'm one of the co-founders and uh, an employee and <clears throat> I'm mainly uh, doing the product management and uh, marketing. Uh, I will share my screen just a second. So uh, much like GrowWise, uh, we are the aim of employee is to optimize uh, business processes just uh, in a different segment and that's uh, HR, more specifically uh, the labor market. So you all know that HR managers in companies, their main responsibility is to keep employees happy, uh, uh, keep employee satisfaction high, um, also try to, to uh, increase the efficiency of their employees, but sadly, uh, most of the HR managers are uh, spending a lot of time, definitely more than they can and they should afford, in uh, hiring, uh, so hiring new employees. Uh, that's exactly what uh, employees trying to solve. Uh, we are making a, a marketplace, a platform, 
for the labor market, which uh, emphasizes a lot on technology. So uh, matchmaking between uh, potential employees and companies. Uh, and basically, um, the matching algorithm, we have a mobile application for candidates, which is designed uh, based on the, their, the, the lifestyle and the habits of the young generation. And uh, web panel for employers in which they can control the whole process. So they don't have to, to use different uh, platforms to post their job ads, then to uh, analyze the, the incoming applications, then make the interviews in a third platform. And uh, basically this uh, loses time and resources because the whole process is spread out in different places. So that's one of the things we are we are trying to to do: bring together all the processes in the in the hiring in one platform, and also, like I said, uh, automate it uh, by using big data uh, and uh, recommendation engine, which shows candidates only the best job ads based uh, based on their experience, uh, their expectations, and their profile. So basically. That's a few screens of the platform. Uh, candidates download the application. They create a profile in employee. So uh, they make their employee CV. And based on that profile, they see uh, the most uh, personalized job ads for them. So, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, when they apply and uh, the interest is mutual between them and the employer, they can. Uh, begin a conversation, direct conversation in the platform via chat and video meetings. So they can form first impressions and uh, speed up the whole process. The algorithm uh, is uh, taking information from a few signals. So mainly uh, textual signals from the resumes of candidates. So uh, the languages that they know, the skills that they have, previous experience and so on. Uh, also contextual uh, signals, which are their expectations, uh, what salary they expect, or working times, location, and uh, also behavioral signals. So the more, the more candidates and companies use the, the platform, uh, the more uh, data is fed into the algorithm. And so the recommendation engine becomes better and better for, for each candidate individually. Uh, another interesting uh, feature is uh, that companies can utilize that recommendation engine and become proactive by diving in our database with candidates uh, where they can view all of the, the profiles in employee anonymously. Of course, they can't see the, the personal information initially of candidates and uh, invite candidates to apply for their open positions. So that way the, the algorithm uh, shows uh, suitable candidates and companies can reach the, the perfect fit uh, more easily. Uh, we launched two years ago now, I think. Uh, we've, we've validated the, the business model here in Bulgaria. We have quite a few uh, Registration from uh, registrations from candidates already around uh, 40, 50,000, uh, and uh, some happy companies as well. And pretty much that's it. Uh, what we might need and what we are actively looking for right now is uh, as many partnerships as possible, be that partnerships in terms of integrations with third party systems or uh, media uh, corporations and companies uh, for, for the purpose of coverage. Uh, the more partnerships, the better. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we are also looking forward to receiving your applications. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, all of you mentioned partnerships as uh, the key need that you currently have. Uh, and before uh, we close uh, this session, again, uh, one more time, do you have any questions, comments, ideas, anything that you would like to share 
this is your last chance for today here with us. Okay, then thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, I will put the link one more time uh, for all of you who got inspired and are willing to apply to our program. Here it is. Uh, my colleague Marionella also put the link and maybe she can do it again uh, to our website of uh, Cluster Sofia Knowledge City, where you can find the information in Bulgarian and in English. The application is in English. Deadline is 27 of May, a month from now. So you can start working. Uh, I wish you all, way, all well, good success. And again, looking forward to receiving your applications and seeing you all soon somewhere, somehow partnering with you and developing some great businesses. Thank you. And have Thank a great you day. for the invitation. Oh. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.